I can talk into the mic, yeah? It's working? <coughs> I guess while we're waiting for the clock to start out, I, I was uh, saying last time I wish I had shown some of the fun videos of the I can talk into perching the mic, yeah? that actually was flapping working? wings. Because we did it. We did actually do that. I'll just pull it up since we got a second here. I guess this while we're waiting the, uh, for the trajectory clock to optimization start. of the flapping wing airplane. I've always thought that looked like a dragging, attacking, uh, like a, you know, a castle or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> I love that. It's like my favorite trajectory optimization ever. Um, we actually built it and it worked. This is one of the videos. It's flapping. It can stop a lot faster when you're pushing against the air like that. We only hit the wire about like once out of four times or something, but <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Are there secret control techniques that we're not allowed to tell you? Geez, I can't even admit it, right? <laughs> now, so I, I, th I do think it, like, when you're an academic, you basically pay people to listen to you, right? You, you do like, take my secrets, please. There's no secrets here. I'm happy to tell you everything I pretend to know. Ah. There is a lot to know, though. You can't cover it all in one term. OK. Um, <clears throat> let's jump back in. I want to pick up where we left, out, left off uh, talking about trajectory optimization and stabilization. Actually, Lou and Alex both just told me to remember uh, an announcement, right? So we have the midterm a week after spring break. We've posted on Piazza, right? Uh, or was it on the, both on Piazza and on the website some old exams to give you a sense of what the questions will look like? The intent is that they look like your homeworks, but of course, we're not going to ask you live coding questions on the midterm. So the the differences between the homework and the <clears throat> and the midterms are most acute in the sort of uh, you know trying to ask programming questions without asking you to write code. Do you understand the, the way we wrote, a, you know, set up that optimization or something like that? What are the decision variables? We gave you, in, and the, hopefully the old midterms will give you an example of how we kind of ask those questions. Um, so those are up, and feel free to ask questions. <clears throat> It'll cover the material up through today and, t and Thursday, uh, and the PSETs cover up only till today. So if we cover more new material, it will be, we won't, uh, Expect you to have PSET level mastery of it, but we, but it's fair game if we covered on Thursday. There'll be one lecture after spring break before the midterm, and it's all it's in in the room during the class. Hopefully, all the logistics are posted and clear on on the website. Also, your project presentation, your project proposals are due along with this PSET. I'm very much excited to read what you guys are thinking about and to give you feedback and iterate with you. That's, uh, that's part of this process. Uh, many of you have been reaching out. If more of you, if you, anybody else hasn't reached out, wants to touch base with us, I mean, we're often here right after class answering questions. We can happy to talk then over email, over Piazza. Uh, feel free to, to discuss with us. <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> Trajectory optimization is a, is a powerful toolbox 
We, I tried to motivate it with some perching examples uh, last time, but we really only scratched the surface on, on what you can do and how you do it. So let me just remind you last time, the most important thing to understand was that we're changing the problem from solving for all, for a policy, meaning a, a controller that works for all possible states, to just a trajectory. We're going to find one particular solution, one set of over time control actions, and that's going to restrict my focus from trying to work over an exponentially increasing number of states, if I were to discretize, you know, some increasingly expanding state space, to just worrying about, you know, a line through time of possible control actions. That's how we beat the curse of dimensionality with trajectory optimization. The problem is, of course, that if you don't consider all possible states, then it's hard to guarantee that you're absolutely optimal. You haven't thought about all the other possible states. You can guarantee that small changes to that trajectory would only make me worse. That's the notion of local optimality. But you really can't guarantee that there wasn't something else I didn't think about that, couldn't, that would have been better. Right? So it's only a, the only notion of optimality is in a local sense, that given my current thinking, any small changes would have made me worse. So that's, this is the trajectory optimization space. <clears throat> and the, there were two main transcriptions. We use the word transcription to say, how do you take your mathematical problem and transcribe it down into a optimization problem, right? The transcriptions we talked about last time were the direct transcription, which is a lousy name. It, says almost nothing in my mind, but that's what it tends to be called. And it is a pretty direct translation of the math into, the, into code. I'm going to make decision variables for both u and x. I'll minimize some finite horizon objective of my additive cost. And I'll just write down, given those are decision variables, I can just write down constraints on the decision variables to impose the dynamics. Um, you know, and then you can start adding in a bunch of additional constraints. A very common one would be to work from a particular initial condition. It's not actually required. You can actually use trajectory optimization to figure out where you want to start in addition to where you want to go. Okay. But if you're in a current location and you want to figure out where to go, then this would be a natural constraint to add. You know, torque limits. These are all, um, you know, we'll talk about non-collision constraints. Today, I'll talk a little bit more detail about how you would formulate those, but all kinds of constraints. <clears throat> the other big cl class, I guess, of, of transcriptions would be the ones that, instead of parameterizing both u and x, they're going to solve away the dynamics. They're going to basically run a simulation every time you try to evaluate the cost, so the cost function is the same. But let me, since I don't have x as the decision variable, let me just use a slightly more clear notation or a different notation to just say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it <coughs> just uh, an unconstrained, potentially unconstrained, I could add additional constraints, but potentially unconstrained optimization and solve before I even call the optimizer for x n plus 1 is some function of x n u n. So I want to make that, make sure I said that clearly, right? So if, I, if my cost function is only a function of u, the way I have to evaluate it is I take my, the, the trajectory u I'm considering, 
I roll it out. I basically run a simulation to figure out what all the x's are. And as I'm rolling it out, I can sum up my costs. Right? So I can completely, as a function of u and some initial conditions, I can run a simulation and I can just evaluate the cost on that. And if I've written it in this form, I have less decision variables and less explicit constraints. Okay, but we talked about how it's not always a win. There's pros and cons to each of these. Are there any questions on that, on that difference or just the, the high level um, formulation of trajectory optimization? Yes. I've solved the constraints before I ever told, talked to the optimizer. Has it always been with this like sampling process where you have to, I guess every time you roll it out, the sample action is going to roll it out? It's still not necessarily, sampling is a separate idea. So let me just repeat the, the question. So does that, um, in what sense am I, you know, getting rid of these dynamics? Do I have to sample over you, right? I could still do just gradient descent without sampling. I could have some initial guess at my u. I could use, I can calculate the total cost from this by simulating and evaluating the cost. I can take the gradients, I can go downhill. That would give me a new u, which I evaluate in the same way. I can write an iterative algorithm that doesn't require sampling. Sampling is one strategy to do the optimization, but it's not required, right? But I can, I, you know, I can still try to optimize this unconstrained long-term optimization. It's a, it's a potentially horribly nonlinear optimization, but it's unconstrained. That's not, that sounds like it's magical. Um, that's not really magic. Like you can always take a constrained optimization and make an unconstrained optimization by just taking your constraints and throwing them up in your objective with a big penalty on, on top of it. And you can make that rigorous. So it's, it's not somehow doing something tr tricky. It's just a choice that we've made the objective much harder to evaluate, but we've removed the constraints, right? And here we made, the objective is relatively simple. It's just a function of the decision variables immediately. No simulations required to evaluate the Ls, right? But, and I've written a constrained form. Those are two different choices, okay? One's not obviously better than the other. Now, these tools were then enough to swing up the pendulum, swing up the carpool, make a plane land on the perch, uh, do all kinds of fun stuff. They are, again, a local, when F is, um, when F or L are non-convex, these are non-convex optimizations and they are potentially subject to local minima. Like I said just now, if you're considering a particular trajectory, you're only looking at that trajectory. You don't know if there's some other trajectory you haven't considered. That's a great question. Those, those. Any other questions on that at that level? Yes. In Jackson, you say one could do gradient descent on you, but it means you have to differentiate to the dynamics. Correct. So, in fact, I, I will talk about that a little bit. So, the, so, the, so in this case, if I wanted to gradient, if I want to take gradients of this long-term loss with respect to you, I still have to take gradients of f. Those, I, I don't get around taking gradients of f, right? Um, I'll, I'll actually, I'll step through that a little bit today. That's a good question, too. Okay, so let's take a minute to talk, to think about, um, you know, how you talk to the solver, right? The way that we, um, if you've got some arbitrary f, uh, you know, what are you willing to tell your solver about specifically, right? So. Um, let's, let's just think for a second about the solver interface. And I guess since I'm talking about the solver, I'll even use pseudocode, I guess, to talk about it. So <clears throat> in the convex optimization problems we've done before, we've done things like add linear cost, you know, um, C transpose X or frog dot add linear constraint um, ax less than or equal to b, right? We can pass these 
these things in, quadratic cost, quadratic constraint. And by passing in, effectively passing in C, or an A and B, the solver knows everything there is to know to think globally about this function. It can evaluate this. You tell it one bit of information, which is this C vector, or you know, this A and B, the coefficients of that. It has the ability to evaluate that constraint at any x. So, you know, what's it going to look like now if I, and we do in, in our syntax now, it's, it looks more like, you know, just I want to add a cost that looks like f of x. You know, what does that look like? What am I actually going to tell the solver about f, right? How, how am I going to pass that in? <coughs> uh, we talked about last time about, you know, the various approaches to nonlinear Optimization, a lot of them are based on taking gradients or even taking uh, local quadratic approximations of the objective, right? If this was my decision variables um, x and this is some objective f of x I'm trying to minimize, right? There's a, the solvers can benefit potentially if you give it gradient information or if you give it even second order information, like the second order Taylor expansion. So should I be passing in this too? Am I going to pass in, you know, the second derivative too? This would be called the Hessian, right? Gradient and the Hessian. Even for a scalar function, that'll be a matrix, right? <coughs> um, so how is that going to work, right? And, it, and I mean, even this is a little bit. Uh, limited, right? You could, start, you could try, and we do have some, like in the sums of squares, we can pass in polynomials. There's, there's, you could ask to express f more richly, but how are we going to do it here? And, and um, how do we do it in the code that you're going to use in Drake, for instance, right? So we really do try to make this abstraction good for you. Um, you know, you can basically make a cost function which takes in x and then returns l of x, right? And I'm going to pass in, I, I really do write something like prog add cost, you know, my cost, I just pass in the function and then you have to associate what variables you want to, to be passed into that function as x. These are the decision variables. Okay, but but I, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna try to use at least gradient-based structure uh, on this this function. So, you know, what do I have to do here in order to let the solvers do a little bit more work with our function? And that depends again on, on your on your solver backend, right? So some some solvers would be called black box solvers or zero order optimization. They'll try to minimize some objective by only ever calling f of x, you know, or my cost x. And they don't need gradients and they won't use them if, if you give it to them, okay? And this is actually the, the stuff that is the focus in reinforcement learning because in reinforcement learning we want our algorithms to also work if we don't know the complete shape of f but we only get to run an experiment in the real world. Okay, so there are a class of solvers that you only have to give it the function and they'll try their best uh, given only that function uh, at, at whatever sample point. The gradient-based solvers or first-order methods like gradient descent will benefit from if you, if you give it partial f, partial x. Oftentimes, a first order solver will, if, if you don't give it f of x, partial f, partial x, it will try to um, approximate it with finite differences. It could, it could 
make itself work like a black box solver by, by taking small, very small samples, numerical differencing. And we talked about sequential quadratic would be a second order Um, so SNOPT, which is the solver that you will use by default in mathematical program, um, is a second order solver. But it actually only, um, if you, you can give it f, you can give it the gradient of f. It doesn't even have an interface to, you, to al allow you to give it the Hessian. I kind of wish it did. But it will, it will estimate the Hessian based on gradients for you behind the scenes in order to make a second order update. <coughs> okay, there are other solvers that you can give the second derivatives too also, uh, but I think oftentimes the approximation you get from, uh, from using the, the first order gradient is a reasonable approximation for the QP. So it's gonna be incredibly important to calculate, uh, you know, to, to calculate our gradients effectively. And so I will talk a little bit about how do you take the gradients even for, for this shooting approach. It turns out that if you were to, um, in Drake, when you, when you actually do add cost, my cost decision variables, and the solver then can call your function. Uh, <clears throat> if you were to put a printout inside your function here while SNOP was solving, and print out x, the type of x, it actually wouldn't be a float. It would be an auto diff variable, okay? So when it's passing in here, it's actually passing in a, a, a structured type that knows how to take gradients as it goes through your math. Okay, so it, um, it uses automatic differentiation. So even though you write it in this abstraction, which is you just think about the math you type on X, uh, for most things you could write in here, it knows how to, when, when you write sine of X, you know, NP sine of X, for instance, it knows to update two numbers. It, uh, it updates X. It also updates the gradient of X using cosine, right? So behind the scenes, it overloads sine of X with sine and cosine with the derivative rules, okay? And it keeps track of all that as you go through. And that works okay when you have your small cost functions and, and small constraints, okay? But when F gets bigger, you know, when F becomes suddenly like a simulation of Atlas, let's say, then uh, the way you compute the gradient of F starts becoming more important. And when I have this sort of long-term optimization across time, the way you compute the gradient of F becomes a lot more important. Using a sort of simple automatic differentiation, may or may not be sufficiently performant. So it really becomes very important for these methods to, to think about where those gradients are coming from, how costly they are to compute, except for very small problems, um, you know, where you can be, be messy about it. But for big problems, you really need to um, think about how to take these gradients. In the direct transcription, the gradients I need are relatively simple. Um, I have decision variables for x and u, I have the functions uh, you know, in, that, that operate directly on decision variables x and u. So in direct transcription, the gradients I need are just the gradients of the cost with respect to x 
you know, the gradients, the cost with respect to u, these look familiar if you've already started your p-set, right? Um, right? I just need a handful of gradients to get the job done. For direct shooting, or any shooting method, things get more complicated, <coughs> right? In order to compute, so, so you know, these constraints, the, the, the thing I want you to realize is when I write Lx and u, f of x, u, explicitly for the solver, then these constraints are actually, um, these are sparse objectives and constraints in the decision variables. That's what makes it so nice, is that L only depends on the immediate decision variable X and the immediate decision variable U. Any one evaluation of L only depends, you know, the, the evaluation at time 13 only depends on X 13 and U at 13. It doesn't depend on X at time 4, X at time 17, right? It's only the, the gradients are, if you were to think of taking the gradients with respect to all of the decision variables, the gradients would be zero for almost all of the decision variables and, and, uh, and only non-zero for a small, small percentage of them. So we'd say that the gradients of these functions are very sparse in the decision variables. In the direct shooting, though, if I think about um, some cost like this, because x of n depends on my, all of my previous u's, and the only decision variables you know, in this problem are u, the L at time 13, if I, I'll, I'll just put a subscript here, depends explicitly on the variables you know, all the way from u1, u2, all the way up to u13. Right? This is dense in the decision variables. And computing that gradient requires more careful methods. Right? Luckily, it's, it's still very structured. Right? So um, I, can, I can take those gradients using the chain rule uh, pretty efficiently. Right, so I do have partial u at 13, partial x 13. And then, knowing the equation for x 13, I know that partial x 13 depended on partial x 12. It also depended on partial u 12, right? And then I also have partial um, U13, which I can compute directly, okay? And then this one, of course, depends on X12, but I can go through and I take the gradient of, with this respect to, I should, you know, partial X12. Partial, I should have written it in there before I finish the equation. I'm sorry, partial X11. You know, this thing's gonna recurse through. Right? And that structure, you know, that function, if you think about it, looks a lot like, so if I think about rolling out the dynamics, I have like f at time zero depends on x zero, u zero, and then I'm gonna take the output of that, and I'm gonna apply f at one, and apply, I guess my f is not dependent on that. I'm gonna apply u at time one to that, and then I'm gonna apply f again to this, u at time two, and so on and so forth, right? That's what my function looks like, and I can take the gradient with respect to any one of those u's by just taking the partial derivative, partial derivative, partial derivative right on the inside of that with the chain rule. Now, 
That might look familiar to you if you, if you use neural networks a lot, right? That's, that looks a lot like a neural network, right? That looks, if I were to draw it in a network form, I could say I've got you know, u0 and x0 coming in, you know, and then I'm going to apply my activation. And then I've got another u1 coming in. I'm going to apply my activation, right? And in fact, the way that you take those gradients efficiently is backpropagation, right? So the chain rule applied to this is exactly comes up with the backpropagation algorithm that's famous in neural networks. They're exactly the same, right? In fact, I mean, the people did it in optimal control before they called it backpropagation in neural networks. It's just, they're typically called adjoint equations in optimal control. And they're particularly elegant in continuous time, but the idea is still the same. It's just the chain rule, okay? And the backpropagation is a, is a specialized instantiation of that for neural networks. But the math is exactly the same. You could also just think about this as doing one of the, you know, this is one of the approaches to uh, automatic differentiation. All right, so I don't know if, you, if you've thought much about automatic differentiation, but People talk about forward mode versus reverse mode automatic differentiation. So the thing I sort of talked through here where I have x is here and the gradient of x is also stored in this variable and it goes through, that's a forward mode automatic differentiation. If you instead have a data structure here that sort of records all of the computations it does, and then at the end goes through and backs up backwards through those computations, then you can do reverse mode automatic differentiation, which is backpropagation in the, in the case of a neural network. Okay? So these things are all very connected and they sh as they should be. But taking gradients efficiently makes a huge difference to the success or the speed of these algorithms. Sorry to move on you again, Alex. But <clears throat> okay, so that's how you take gra the gradients through time um, if you're doing shooting. You don't have to do that for, di for direct transcription. But how do you take the gradients with respect to f? Even every, both of them require somewhere this partial f, partial x to be evaluated, partial f, partial u. If f, like I said, is, is atlas, or, or even maybe worse, would be uh, a robot manipulator with like a thousand objects it's trying to pick up, right? That's higher dimensional than atlas, and it has different structure. So it's interesting to ask, how do you take the gradients of f? is complex, is complicated, not common. Don't mean to imply it has imaginary elements. <clears throat> so if F, you will um, probably in your lives use uh, neural networks to represent F, right? Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do is to try to learn a model of your robot or your system that you're trying to control in a neural network, in which case these gradients would come directly out of the backpropagation. You get them from Py PyTorch, you're good, right? If F is the multibody equations, should you do forward mode or reverse mode differentiation? What do you think? Anybody know? <laughs> 
if f is not a neural network, it's a, the multi-body equations. If it's f equals ma, but it's my manipulator equations, right? It's these equations. There's some wisdom about the, whether you should do, you know, how you should take gradients of these kind of equations. I wonder if anybody has a guess. Awesome. So, so the, the, the statement was uh, that a, a common rule is that um, reverse mode, reverse mode is more complicated to implement almost always, but it pays off when the number of outputs is small, right, and the, compared to the number of inputs. So the reason that reverse mode is such a good choice for optimal control and for neural networks is the same reason. It's because you're trying to take the gradient of a scalar cost with respect to a lot of parameters. So you go all the way to, to the end of a lot of computation, you get a scalar number, and all you have to back up is the gradient of that scalar with respect to your parameters. That's why reverse mode wins in neural networks, that's why reverse mode wins in the optimal control setting. But F is taking in the same number of parameters here, you know, plus some extra ones for you, as it's putting out. So the dimensionality doesn't make it obviously one way or the other. Well, doesn't, doesn't, it's, it's not the case where reverse mode is obviously better, right? Because F is, it's a N dimensional state. It puts out N, it's also an M dimensional U input. So it turns out you can do better than PyTorch can do because there's, there's structure in here. The answer is that neither first or uh, forward or reverse fully takes advantage of the structure of the multi-body equations. And the best, you know, um, the best codes to do this exploit the structure heavily and you can write specialized gradients. The same way we did when we talked about taking the linearization around a fixed point and we said a bunch of those terms are actually zero. You don't even have to take those gradients, right? Both forward and reverse mode get caught up in that and you can do specialized gradients uh, in order to make those fast. Now, um, there's actually, so there's a, there's a researcher I like very much, Justin Carpentier, who's, got, who's done some nice work on this. Actually, Tuan Kulin also is an expert in this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> Justin's got a great implementation of this stuff in his software package called Pinocchio. Drake right now actually doesn't have that yet. It's doing forward mode automatic differentiation through the dynamics. Um, so it's slow at taking the gradients of big complicated uh, multi-body systems right now. I'm gonna, probably gonna try to implement that while you're on spring break, but we'll see if we can, if I finish it or not. I, I actually would like to, uh, we've had people who like, would have had better projects if the gradients were faster. Uh, so I wanna just fix that, because we know how to do it. Uh, it's just a matter of, of implementing it. There's lots of structure. There's like a, you know, uh, there's a million things to know about control and there's a lot of things we know how to sort of implement very well. And then there's some fraction of that that we've actually implemented very well and have gotten through code review and have it in, you know, in the, in the library. And so I actually, would, every time I teach, I try to push a few more of those things <laughs> through the pipeline so that we have uh, more and more of the ideas represented in, in code. <clears throat> so I, I think I gotta implement these, these gradients for you uh, next week. Okay, so that's, uh, gradients are super important. Uh, you would think that second order uh, approximations, like in the um, iterative LQR, we took second order approximations which you're some of you are working on, it's perfectly okay if you're still working on it or haven't even started, but you will see, you'll take second order um, gradients of your cost, but only first order gradients of the dynamics, which is a, a, nice, uh, a nice feature of the iterative LQR algorithm, okay? But we do take gradients of, partial, you know, of F in order to use iterative LQR, and if your system is very complicated, uh, taking that efficiently matters.
with me? Yes? That wasn't super convincing, but um, okay. So let's think about um, how to write how the modeling power we've potentially unlocked. And really, we've unlocked it by saying we're using gradient-based solvers. Um, we're, doing, we're not trying to solve the whole optimal control problem to global optimality. Anything we could take a gradient of is fair game. Okay, and that opens up, it means that we, we have less theoretically and, and even in practice that we can say about the solutions, but we can tr apply it to a very broad class of problems. Roughly anything we can take a gradient of efficiently. Any constraints that we can take gradients of, any objectives we take gradients of are potentially fair game. So to think through that a little bit, let's just think a little bit about um, collision avoidance constraints. Now collision avoidance constraints, you know, planning around obstacles is sort of a classic example of where local minima can be a problem for these methods, right? So if I have um, a very artistically impaired airplane that is trying to move around some obstacle, okay? And if its current guess at the optimal trajectory is something like this, it's trying to get to some goal here. <clears throat> Maybe the optimal trajectory, because the wind is blowing or for some other reason, would be to go around here. This is a sort of a classic example of saying that if I want the airplane to not run into the obstacle, you understand my art here, this is an obstacles plane. Um, if I want the airplane to not run into the obstacle, then I'll write a constraint saying, you know, don't go in here. Going in here violates the constraints. And if I'm just taking Considering current solutions around here, looking at small deviations to this, looking at the gradients um, of this and making updates, then it's very unlikely that I will bounce over to here and find the better solution. This is a classic case of local, optim local optima uh, in motion planning. The reason is if I'm incrementally changing my trajectory and I have one that's you know, on the boundary of this obstacle, it looks like incrementally I have to get worse I have to violate my constraints before I can get better again by getting all the way to the other side. Right? So that's exactly like the case of I have to get worse before I get better. It's happening in the constraint instead of the objective, but it's the same kind of a local uh, optima. Okay. <clears throat> but how do we even write that collision avoidance constraints? Because these, these methods do work well. I told you people are using them on autonomous cars and people are, with the Boston Dynamics is using them on, on Atlas. Right, so there's some ability to, to reason about these constraints and they still can do fairly well if you have a good initial guess. <clears throat> you know, sometimes you will see if in the early steps of a, let's say a second order optimization, it might take big enough steps to hop across, but you've just gotten lucky if that happens. But these, you know, these methods will send quad rotors through obstacle fields and the like, um, but it requires writing this don't run into the obstacle constraint. So let's just think about that uh, for a second, okay? So um, <clears throat> so let's say I've got my, my cart here and my position of my cart is X and I've got a wall here. So collision avoidance constraints in some sense can be easy, right? They can be just sort of linear constraints in this case, saying that the, um, you know, the position of the cart relative to the wall is less than the wall in, the, in this case. This is the easy case where there's no other side of the wall. Right? It gets more interesting here if I'm allowed to be on the other side too, which would be a, a non-convex uh, constraint again. You know, maybe more generally what I want to say is that the distance which is a function of x, the distance to the wall is greater than some minimum distance. Right, I could just, I could write this, this constraint if, uh, equivalently as trying to compute for whatever x the distance, maybe I should do it from the 
front of the obstacles when it runs in, the distance between the obstacle and the wall, and just say that the distance is less than some, or is greater than some threshold. Okay? So this doesn't look like a scary constraint when I write it like this. Even this doesn't look like a scary constraint. But let's think about how that scales up. Okay, now I'm in, if I'm in my, my plane example again here, okay, and I've got some obstacle here, maybe the, the closest distance, I'll call it D here, to my obstacle, I can still write even in a higher dimensional space. I mean, typically it would be in uh, the 3D, I mean, D lives in a, it is a scalar, but it, this, this difference vector lives in, um, not in joint space or something, but in the, the Euclidean space, the, the Cartesian space of the world, okay? <clears throat> so I could, but I could compute, you could imagine computing for any configuration Q of my airplane, the distance between, as a function of Q and my obstacle, and make that higher than some minimum distance. Computing that, it used to be like in the, in the um, you know, in the days when I made examples that looked more like this, you know, we, also, we always had, uh, you know, polygonal uh, obstacles or maybe ellipsoidal. Those are the two cases where you don't spend too much time writing your math, uh, right? And you could sort of, you'd assume that maybe the, the airplane was a sphere and you'd sort of, you could compute that distance fairly effectively. Nowadays, we can load up arbitrary geometries in a, into a complicated geometry engine and ask for the distance between two geometries and it can be expensive to do, but the, all, the, all the equations are in there. So you can ask, you know, given two um, geometries, the math is much better if the geometries are convex, by the way, you know, the, um, the the definitions of distance are super clear and the algorithms for finding the minimum distance are, are, are understood and fully tested, okay? But you can, you can ask like, what's the distance between the, the, you know, the, the closest point on my airplane to my obstacle and take the dis difference between those as my distance. So that's a reasonable thing to do. But it's an expensive operation. Taking the gradients of this distance are actually not too hard either because if I know where this point is, the closest point on the two objects, and I know how the objects locally change with the change in Q, then actually changing, computing the change in distance is, is easy enough too. If, you have a, if you've got a collision engine that will tell you the closest points, and their distance, then getting the gradients of that is, is simple. So that's nice. Okay, but if I start having a complicated, um, you know, obstacle field, and I'm doing this a lot, then again, being a little bit more efficient about this uh, makes a big difference. In particular, if there's like, I don't know, more polygonal obstacles way over here, it's pretty frustrating if you're spending a lot of computation time thinking about all, the, all you know, the distance here and the finding the closest point between this object, you know, my plane and this object and taking the gradient of respect to that and telling that to your solver, that's pretty wasteful, okay? So what's the remedy for that? Now that we're, you know, allowed to put sort of arbitrary nonlinear functions in here, there's a standard way to say basically, I'm gonna take the distance, I want it to be greater than, than d min, but I'm gonna have this constraint sort of disappear to be trivially satisfied if the distance gets far enough away. To the point where I can tell my collision engine, I only care about distances up to some threshold. And I know that if I ignore the distance to those objects, that I haven't changed the cost, the constraint. Okay, so people call this a hinge loss, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> 
for a hinge, cons hinge function in a constraint. Okay. And <clears throat> there's lots of ways uh, to write them. People sometimes have strong opinions about which ones work for well for which solvers. Uh, and there's, I think, a lot of empirical evidence you know, that people have about which, which, which way to taper off your, your function works well. Um, but there's not much theory. I mean, once, once you're in this land of like, you know, gradient-based optimization with lots of constraints that are interfering and you're going to try to taper them off in some curve, I, I don't know how to tell you how to pick one. You just you try a few. I can tell you the one that uh, is the default you will get. So um, <clears throat> in Drake, I think I have it up here, there's a minimum distance constraint. Okay, which actually it doesn't it computes the the distance between all of the points uh, obstacles up to th some threshold. As soon as d gets farther than some threshold, it won't return any of those objects. Okay, but instead of telling the solver about um, a different constraint for each obstacle, it actually just just returns sort of the minimum distance across many obstacles. So it's, it manifests itself as one constraint, the minimum distance between the airplane and all of the obstacles, or between any of the joints in the robot and themselves, right? But just the minimum distance that I'm worried about having collision comes out as a single scalar constraint, okay? And then the way that, they, that, that we do that is we can use our collision, we can use cleverness in the collision engine to quickly rule out far away things. We, there's something called broad phase collision detection, which allows you to quickly rule out things that are far away with axis aligned bounding boxes and things like this. Okay. But to, to, I don't want this object, if it's right on the boundary here, I don't want it to like wink in and wink out of my constraints and have my constraint value change discontinuously if it's right on the boundary. That's the problem I'm trying to avoid right now is I want to have a smooth transition in my, in my distance from, from my constraints, even if this was the only distance. If it suddenly comes into my threshold, I want to smoothly turn that on. Otherwise, my gradient-based solver is going to see some discontinuity and it's going to get caught. Okay? So that's where you get these hinge functions that come in. So the one that's the default, there's a bunch of them implemented you can, you can pick between. We'll take the distance, the closest distance to all the points, and it will put it through a curve where there's some minimum distance you care about. And then there's some um, maximum distance. It's called the distance of influence in the code there. Um, I've got it a little bit weird. I'm thinking of it this way, but. Uh, as getting bigger distance, which is, I can change that, I guess. It's the way I always think about hinge losses, but I should change it because of what I just said. So you get a curve that, that um, let me not make sure I don't flip my signs completely. So if the influence is that way, I was right the first time. Inf okay, influence is here. It's zero if I'm past the distance of influence. Okay, and it's, there's a minimum distance here. Okay, good. There's a game of coming up with smooth cost functions, which is my, um, my approximation of the, of the distance that would be, you know, in the very simple case here of just the distance to the wall. If I had one object and I didn't care at all about performance or anything, and I just, I would just take the straight line, which is the total distance from all the objects. Okay, but I want to have something that as objects get far enough away and are trivially satisfying my constraint, their influence goes to zero. Okay, so I'm going to take my straight line distance to those objects. That goes to the origin, by the way, and I'm going to curve it off in some way that's sufficiently smooth, I can take gradients through, it's differentiable everywhere through the solver so that the influence goes to zero and my solver, if it doesn't ever even report 
um, collision detection events out here, I've still got a perfectly smooth optimization landscape, okay? And the default in Drake is to use a quadratic um, hinge loss here. So this looks like a function, if I were to scale it between zero and one, it looks like a function that's um, zero if x is greater than zero. It looks like um, x squared over two for negative one to x to zero, and then uh, what, negative one half minus x for x less than one. So it's a piecewise function, but it's one that's chosen so that when x is zero, the gradient is actually zero. It, it tapers off perfectly. There's no discontinuity even in the gradient. And again, when x gets back to this, to this breaking point, the gradient is still continuous. And all of my gradient-based sol solvers, hopefully, will s sail right through here. And I get the benefits of this tapered effect, but the smoothness of the optimization. Yes? So it's not like the circle that we've drawn that is a hard boundary or anything, but the whole boundary looks like this. Yes, so, so there is a hard boundary that's important, which is the thing I tell my collision engine, which says if you do broad phase detection and are able to rule out anything beyond that boundary, then you don't even have to tell me about it. And that makes it, the collision queries much more efficient. But the way we achieve that is we taper the effect as we get closer to that boundary so it's exactly zero as it gets to the boundary. Yeah. Same thing for your, I remember you asked about potential functions way back, right? And uh, the navigation functions, the same kind of tricks work in those, in those potential navigation functions to have bounded domain uh, about that. Okay, so differentiability is a big deal, um, right? The, and scalability is a big deal in these methods. But the class of possible costs and constraints is broad and you can be creative about finding those sort of, those solutions. Questions about that? Does that make sense? So part of the power of having a trajectory optimization library is actually just this big list of possible costs and constraints that have been written for you, right? And then, you know, normally it's Hung Kai. If you, if, you, if you ever come across Hung Kai, normally Hung Kai went through and thought really hard about exactly the right hinge losses and, you know, has a good implementation of them. Um, but if you want to say things like, um, you know, that some object is at a relative orientation compared to another object in space, like my right hand is is at a relative orientation relative to this object I'm gonna pick up, for instance. Then you can, there's ways to write nonlinear constraints that will impose those orientations and take the gradients all the way through all the joints of your robot in order to make that work. If you wanted to say that um, your center of mass is above, the, uh, above your feet, your support polygon, so you don't fall down. If you wanna say that your momentum is, is obeying some constraint, the total momentum of your robot, there's like a huge list of these possible constraints that if you have a multi-body plant and you want to now add them to your, your solver, you can just start adding them in, adding them in, adding them in. And ultimately, I mean, that's ultimately the reason that we decided to take mathematical program and the multi-body and the physics engine, the multi-body plan, and keep them in the same package. We often talked about trying to split Drake into pieces, right? But the fact that these can go together so well is makes the value of keeping them in one place. It's actually, um, so we did this a bunch back on uh, in the DARPA challenge. So uh, every time we solved, um, you know, moving around Atlas, we would solve this optimization problem using uh, even just the, forget about a trajectory, but even just to decide where we're gonna pose the robot we would use all these rich constraints, like the end effector needs to be in some position, the joint limits have to be satisfied, you avoid collisions, gaze constraints is a really important one, so you have to say like the hand stays inside the perception system's field of view, right? Um, your feet shouldn't move, you, you have to stay inside of your um, support polygon. And that was just a single nonlinear optimization which just says, find me a joint angles Q that are as close as possible to some comfortable joint position, right? And then satisfied this huge rich list of constraints, 
Um, <clears throat> and then we just solved it with SNAP. Uh, taking those, all, those gradients are all efficient and analytical already. Um, and try to exploit the, inter, the kinematic chain sparsity. And b back in 2015, we were solving this at 100 hertz. So you could just solve this at real time rates and, and, and move the robot around. Right, so we had to solve some pretty hard kinematics problems on Atlas, right? This is all using these rich constraints. The funniest one I always thought was um, that they gave us this 400 pound humanoid, the svelte version of Atlas. Atlas is like so tiny now, but it used to be this big guy. And then they have told us that the robot must drive this little Polaris in the competition. Um, and if you saw it, it, like the robot barely fits in the car. In fact, the only place that it fits in order to drive, it actually has to sit in the passenger seat <laughs> because it didn't fit under the steering column. And it would put its leg across and just barely touch the drivers. We couldn't hit the brake if we wanted to. Um, <laughs> luckily, it was pretty slow, you know. And we, we were driving like this, and then getting out of the car was a nightmare. Okay, but that was all using this nonlinear optimization pipeline. And then trajectory optimization is in some sense just a little embellishment on that, where you take the same library. This is, uh, I don't know why it didn't play that well, okay. Uh, we had to like lift two by fours around in the competition. Uh, I was telling people today that there was, a, there was a bad day where we had a hand snap a cable and we just had to walk around for the rest of the competition with a two by four <laughs> stuck in our hand. Um, so we'd never use that hand again, but uh, uh, this is now, just think about this as putting in the, into the language of optimal control. Now we just have to optimize a trajectory of cues subject to these, con these constraints. But you add those same constraints at all of the different times of your optimization and suddenly you're doing fancy trajectory optimization. And this works for, you know, quad rotors flying through obstacles, right? So this is cool. Um, but it, I want it to not be, I don't want to mislead you with that, right? So it does have local minima. It found a trajectory here, but it could have easily gotten stuck. I don't know if that's a global optima. I, I would be surprised if it is. We told it, find a straight path from, you know, straight through the, through the obstacle field. It, it was initially in collision. It moved itself out of collision and did this fancy obstacle. It was able to find a fancy obstacle avoiding trajectory around there. But it might have actually been better to go like over here and come around, uh, and it would not. The trajectory optimization that we were doing then would not have found that. Okay, it's a powerful tool chain. Um, you can do a lot of things with it. A transition to stabilization of trajectories unless people have more questions about optimization. Yes? Absolutely, so, so um, right, so you don't, so the question is how does it apply to direct co-location? In fact, most of these are, my tool of choice for continuous systems are direct co-location. Computing the gradient of F efficiently still matters, the gradient of L still matters. You don't have to do the chain rule through time for direct trans for direct colocation, right? Just like both direct transcription and colocation are adding the constraints in a sparse way, and you just take the local gradients. It's only the shooting that requires the long-term gradients. But yes, all of those constraints can be applied. The trajectory optimization classes, you know, have a base class that's multiple shooting and um, and direct colocation. All these things you can just add costs either at a single time point or at multiple time points. Uh, but they all, all those ideas apply. Awesome, yes? Um, the distance from an object for collisions are a single scalar, right? For all the, all the constraints? Yes. So wouldn't that, you mentioned you were really worried about it jumping around with the thing and objects coming in and out of the bounding box. How would you handle the fact that if you have two, two ob you're threading between two objects, you're going to bounce between them if you're slightly, if you're closer to one than the other. That's a really good question. Okay, so. He's, he's, this, the question is, um, you know, we're using a scalar distance to say the closest distance. You know, if I'm threading the needle between two objects, then the question is, does the distance change discontinuously, right? So 
So even if on, on a small change in my trajectory, the closest distance um, switches from being against this obstacle to being against this obstacle, the, um, the, the function is continuous. It might, be dis, uh, it might have a discontinuous derivative. Right, as you mentioned, we were, you, you might use the local derivatives of the curvature of the object to establish its continuous. It should be, um, right, it should be C1, right? It could be that the gradients change discontinuously. Yeah, so, so that could be a case where the solver is un, unhappy, but it's at least not this, right? Um, but yeah, I th it's relatively robust to that. So, so if we were to drop off at the edge and have an object come in by default, then I would, I would worry more about getting something like this, okay? This one, um, if the gradients change is less, I mean, it's, it's still not good. You're right, it's still not good. But it's less damning than this one. Right. So maybe this, you might say running the problem is you get to the end of spreading the noise between the two objects, and you see one of the objects suddenly go from no cover to oh, no object anymore. It could be, for instance, that you take a very big gradient step here because you were optimistic about the way things were going, and you didn't see this coming. That's exactly the problem, right? So, so if, if my local method was saying something like, oh, I've got smooth sailing, and didn't realize there was a discontinuity coming that it could be overly aggressive, that it might jump over into this ob obstacle, something like that. Great question. Yes. Yeah. OK. So the first one is like, you know, I have a few examples. Like Ella has mentioned in the previous talk that the quality is uh, of type of water is really need to uh, like, uh, uh, make the, lift the, the object from the super high dimension. Ah, great question. So, um, so the first question was, uh, was am I doing collision? Am I writing this, this, these distance uh, objects, you know, constraints? Is my computational geometry engine taking distances in high dimensions because I have to make the object in configuration space? No, it's actually not. So first, the first thing I do is I figure out as a function of Q all of the poses of the robot, and then in that pose I ask my I I've, I've now I've got a function that has put all the geometry in 3D. I take the distance in 3D always no matter how many joints are on the robot. And then I take the gradient of how that distance changes through my joint angles, which is in high dimensions. My gradient is in high dimensions, but my distance calculations and my geometry calculations are always in 3D. Even when I, we're doing it in 2D, I still run through the 3D collision engine just because that's the way the code's written. I'll come back to your second question in a second, yeah. So um, the question is, how does it relate to other motion planning approaches? SLAM is, is an estimation approach, which is a, a different branch, although you can use these techniques to do SLAM, too. If you, instead of, if you solve the trajectory backwards in time instead of forwards in time, that would be an estimation problem instead of a, a planning problem. Uh, but we'll, 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 compare it, we'll, um, we'll compare it to like randomized motion planning later. For instance, if you've heard of RRT or probabilistic roadmaps, um, those tend to be more based on, on um, not robots that have dynamic constraints. Trajectory optimization, the ability to put in the dynamic constraints of my robot natively, trajectory optimization has always done better than sampling-based planner for that, in that re regard. You can squeeze them into sample-based planners, but they're not as natural. Um, so there, I think there really are two big families of trajectory optimization or sample-based planning, and we will talk about how to get dynamics into sample-based planning uh, in a future lecture. Good question. Yes? Uh, this is a more general question, but like we learned about like in the aftermath of you know, what it did to the robot, and here we have trajectory optimization, which is really, really overpowered at this point. Like it seems like you can put everything in the, in the world into a constraint, and it seems like it will just do the job. So like why, like, is there some I love that you asked that question. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so I don't mean to make it. So there's, there's hard limitations in this. So the question is, um, you know, we've talked about Lyapunov, HJB, powerful tools. This looks like it can do all that and more. Why would, why did we even talk about <laughs> the first stuff? Um, so the limitations of this being a local method can be severe. So, um, for instance, 
in the DARPA Robotics Challenge, we had cool trajectory optimization that would make the robot run and stuff like this in simulation. We never used that in the competition. Why? Because there's always a chance that I'd call my nonlinear optimization and it says, eh, I didn't find anything. You know, like it's not just it could have found a bad trajectory. It could be that it can't find any trajectory, even if a trajectory exists. Right? It could get stuck saying, I don't know how to satisfy all of your constraints. There is no solution. Or, I mean, it roughly says, I'm confused. It's like a snopped error code, you know, I'm confused. And, and, uh, and it, I don't like the idea of our 400 pound robot, you know, moving along trying to win a $2 million competition going, eh, nah, I didn't find a solution. <laughs> so, so because of that, we just, we don't use them as much. And in fact, um, uh, what I'll talk about when we talk about stabilization is that even autonomous driving companies and, and Boston Dynamics these days, oftentimes they will offline use trajectory optimization to compute a library of trajectories that they know is good and they don't have to run that online and they, they use a more local LQR or, I, you know, or more guaranteed approach that has to run in, in real time. So this is spectacular for making the find for discovering things, but it might require hand tuning it's hard to rely on to, to work every time. Thank you for asking that. It's maybe gender related, but also like a configuration site question. But because you're going to be considering like how changing the joint in the configuration of the robot impacts like things in the derivative code, can you get trapped in like local minima in the same way where maybe there's some fancy code the robot could make to fit through obstacles, but you're just never going to find it? Absolutely. You, so, so the question is, you know, it, so the, the, the question of threading a needle or, or having, you know, a, a hard to satisfy constraint. Yeah, the geometry I think you're implying in your head here is it's even worse in joint space, in configuration space, because um, something that looks like a big passage in 3D might actually be a very narrow passage. We have some examples of a robot reaching into a shelf and you think, oh, it's not a, it's a you know, it's a reasonable shelf. But it's a big robot, and by the time you look at it in joint space, it's like a super narrow gap that the planner has to find its way through in order to reach in there. So these things can look very scary in configuration space, and these local methods are not complete, meaning there can be solutions that would satisfy all the constraints that these are not guaranteed to find. You cannot be guaranteed it will find a solution if it exists. So um, great for videos and demos but harder to, to rely on. That's actually a beautiful transition. I've got to budget myself uh, now, but I, I love the questions. So um, what would it look like to try to guarantee? Some? So let's take that trajectory library idea. I'll build off, off that a little bit. So um, let's say making it reliable. Um, so let, let me distinguish between um, local planning, local trajectory optimization versus global planning, right? So the same tools that we've written in for trajectory optimization can in some sense be used in both ways, right? So the the way I've demonstrated it here has been in the sort of global planning sense, right? Find a path through the trees. Subject to x dot equals f of x u. That's not an easy problem, right? And it's a, it may work, it may not work. <clears throat> but there's, there is sort of a limiting regime where you would expect the problem to be easy again. So a, 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 there's a local version of this where let's say given, let's say my cost function um, is given a nominal trajectory I'll, I'll use desired trajectory so I'll write xd ud or desired, yeah? If my cost function 
looks more like um, minimize the difference between, let me be careful with my notation, xn minus xd of n good here. I'm ad-libbing a little bit. That's in the way it manifests is always my notation, so I have to think about it a little bit more. Okay. <clears throat> but there's some limit where if my initial guess is close to the desired guess, where I would kind of expect this to become reliable again, right? It starts to look like an LQR problem, right? Intentionally. I've tried to write it like this. Okay. And that looks like a, can be potentially a lot more like a local planning problem, okay? And in fact, that, that is what people will do, is they'll start to um, use the same kind of tool chain in a place where you can guarantee something about the solutions being found. So let me connect that back to what we've seen before with the linear MPC. <clears throat> So there's an extreme case which is the linear um, quadratic programming but I'll call it linear MPC for reasons that we we know right now here which is that if f of x u is ax plus bu l is convex in generally in general for instance, quadratic with r greater than zero. <clears throat> In this case, trajectory optimization formulations is a convex optimization. this case, it is reliable, and I am willing to run it even on an autonomous car that's driving around people, right? So in the same way we use linearization of nonlinear systems plus LQR, there's going to be some regime where my f of x looks enough like, you know, it's close enough to my nominal trajectory that I can lean a little bit on the stronger results from convex optimization solve only a convex optimization problem and try to make some guarantees about the uh, performance on the nonlinear system. I made two jumps there. I should, I should have done one at a time. Okay? But the first thing is that there's a limit where the, con the, the program, again, is convex. We actually started with that when I introduced trajectory optimization, but I'm reminding you now that when AX, the dynamics were linear and the cost was quadratic, this was a generalization of LQR. It can handle constraints, convex constraints, but it's a convex optimization. That one I am willing to solve. Okay. The interesting thing is how do these two play in, in concert? So <clears throat> use the reliable, let's say, convex formulation. to stabilize a trajectory. Solved, let's say, offline with non-convex optimization. <clears throat> 
that's sort of an interesting mix where you can get some of the richness of the solution trajectories that you've got offline. You collect a family of them that might be available online, but the problem you only solve online is, is a convex problem, okay? This is actually um, a, you know, a powerful tool chain, and there's a bunch of things to say about it, which I have to um, qualify. So let me introduce the idea, and then we'll pick it up again next time. But um, there's a few key ideas about what you can do to sort of make this reliable, okay? It's not enough, really, for it to be convex, but if you want to, um, uh, if you want to use this in an online fashion, you also, in order to reject model errors and things like this, we're going to do model predictive control. MPC. Many of you know MPC the name, but I hope you'll appreciate its, some of its details by the end of this discussion, which will be in two parts. <laughs> Okay, the MPC idea is going to be, I'm going to solve a trajectory optimization. I'll get, let's say, x over time, u over time. I'll execute u at the first u. I'll let my dynamics advance. The world does that for you if you're not in simulation, okay? The dynamics advance, and now I'll measure, I'll, I'll, I'll measure what my x1 turned out to be. If my model was accurate, you know, you'd like it to be very close to what you planned. But if your model was inaccurate, you might be a little bit off or if there's just noise in the system. Okay, and then we're going to just throw the rest out. Set x0 to this new configuration and, and replan, okay? So if you can do trajectory optimization fast enough to do it at real-time rates with, your, uh, with the world advancing, and especially if you have a reliable solver that you can trust won't crash in the middle of this loop and say, I can't find a solution, then this gets into a very powerful mode where you can do something called model predictive control, where you can use trajectory optimization on the fly to become a controller, not just a plan, but an entire feedback loop that's adjusting, it's making new plans based on the current measurements and, and executing, okay? There's a few really important ideas in model predictive control that can make this guaranteed. The fact that you'd like to, you'd like to be able to guarantee that if I found a solution on the previous step and I put it through the system, that there's still going to be a solution at the next step, that I won't suddenly get myself in a situation where um, the constraints can't be satisfied. Right? You have to worry about something called recursive feasibility. There's a few important lessons from this. Um, and we'll, I guess we'll have to pick that up next time. Okay? Good. So um, I actually told Alex that this might happen, which is that um, I wasn't going to get through all the cool things to say about trajectory optimization and stabilization. So I will talk about it again on Thursday, which means SysID won't be on the midterm. That's probably only a good thing, I think. But uh, I'll update that on the calendar. <laughs>